Hi, I'm Matthias Beck. I'm one of the authors of Computing the Continuous Discreetly. And in this video, we'll start chapter 13 on solid angles. So let me tell you the setup. We are starting with the polytope. And very soon this will be a rational polytope, but for the initial definition, we can think of any polytope. And I want to define the angle at some point x in P. Let me give you a two-dimensional intuition of what I want to do. So maybe we have a polygon. And I want to now look at a point, let's say maybe over here, in the polygon. And I want to associate an angle with it. And the way I will measure this, I will put a disk around my point and then measure which part of the disk is inside the polygon. So I will normalize the disk to have area one. And so for this point, my angle will be one half. If X is in the interior of my polygon, that will have an angle of one. And so things get interested in dimension two only at, at a vertex. So at a vertex, I will have an angle that we sort of normally measure in the plane, except that that 360 angle gets normalized to be one. I want to now have a concept like this in any dimension. So what I'll do is I'll measure things with a ball of radius epsilon centered at my point x. So this will be a d-dimensional ball centered at x and radius epsilon. And I think of my epsilon as a small number because you can see if this disk here gets too big, eventually I will not measure an angle of one half. But you can see, as long as my radius is small enough, the uh, angle measure is well defined. And so here's the definition of a solid angle in general dimension. So we'll measure the portion of this ball that's inside of P. And of course, we're measuring volume here, normalized to the volume of the ball. And again, if epsilon is small enough, this quantity does not depend on the radius epsilon. And this makes this definition well defined. If you want to, I can also take the limit as epsilon goes to zero of this fraction. But we don't really have to take a limit over here. We just need to say that epsilon is small enough. So here's a picture in three dimensions. We're centering a ball here at a vertex of some polytope. And you can see we're measuring the part of the ball that's inside my point. Let me make a few comments. I'll start with an example. So this is now in general dimension. So if x is in the interior of the polytope, with small enough epsilon, our ball will be inside the polytope. And that means we're measuring angle 1. This is sort of one extreme, and the other extreme is if x is not in the polytope, then my ball will not intersect p, again, if epsilon is small enough, and so that means we're measuring an angle of zero. And so again, the interesting part is sort of in between. For example, if you're now on a facet, if you're in the relative interior of a facet, we will always measure angle one half. And then things become really interesting when we move x to a face that's of co-dimension bigger than one. You can convince yourself that along faces, my angle will always remain invariant. And so that allows me to define the solid angle of a face. So this f here is a face of my polytope by saying I will measure the angle of 
any point in the relative interior of my face. So again, this is invariant as I move along my face, as long as I'm staying in the relative interior, and that allows me to make this definition. Okay, what are we after? So what we want to do now is a version of lattice point enumeration, except that we're not counting each integer point in my polytope with weight one. I will count them with weight equal to its solid angle. So here's the central definition. We call this the angle sum of my polytope. And now I'm assuming that P is a rational polytope. We're summing over all integer points in T times P. T as before will be a positive integer dilation parameter. And again, instead of counting each integer point once, we're weighing it with the solid angle. Yeah, so we're computing the solid angle of the integer point with respect to T times P. We just said that outside of my polytope, the angle is zero. So we can think of this as a sum of all integer lattice points. What's special about this counting function now, I should really maybe say this measuring function, compared to the Erhard counting function, the Erhard quasi-polynomial? Well, one thing you might notice already in two dimensions is that solid angles have an additive character. If I take a polytope and I cut it into two pieces somehow, as long as these two pieces intersect in a lower dimensional object, like here, the solid angle sum will add up because if I have a point, let's say over here, then the solid angle that I'm measuring with respect to one polytope and the one I'm measuring with respect to another polytope, they will nicely add up to give me the solid angle that I'm measuring in the union. When we started talking about Erhard polynomials, we said that sometimes we need to use inclusion-exclusion. So we're adding things, but then have to subtract what's happening on the uh, intersection. And what we're saying here, as long as this intersection is lower dimensional, we don't have to subtract anything. This has a terminology, this function A sub P is totally additive. That's an advantage over the situation with the Erhard polynomials or quasi-polynomials. And we will see that this advantage will play a role. But for now, there is another connection to Erhard quasi-polynomials. It follows from the fact that the solid angle over faces are invariant. And what this means is that we can measure each angle at a face and then multiply this by the number of integer points on the interior of this face. So you see this on the last line over here, the solid angle counting function can be expressed as a sum over the Erhard quasi-polynomial of the interiors of the faces. And then I have to weigh each one of those quasi-polynomials by the solid angle of the face. And this now has the immediate consequence that we can say what the solid angle function looks like. Namely, if P is rational, then all of my faces are rational. And so we know these functions over here are quasi-polynomials, and I'm just weighing them with some factor. So what I'm doing here is I'm summing up quasi-polynomials, and that means my solid angle sum is also a quasi-polynomial. We can say a little more. For example, the leading coefficient has to come from the face that is the polytope itself. And so the leading coefficient will be the volume or the relative volume of my polytope. And again, because all of my ingredients here are quasi-polynomials, and we also know that the periods of these quasi-polynomial divides the denominator of my polytope, that means the period of my solid angle sum also divides the denominator. So we get the structure for free because we've studied Erhard quasi-polynomials. But we will see also from first principles 
why this function will be a quasi polynomial. The next thing we will define, this is not going to be a surprise to you, is the analog of an integer point transform in the solid angle world. For my integer point transform, I'm just summing z to the m over all integer points in p. And so what I'm now doing, I will weigh each of those monomials by the solid angle of m. We'll call this multivariate generating function alpha sub p. When we did this in the classical case for integer point transforms, the central theorem was Stanley reciprocity. I'm reminding you here. So this was the simplicial version, but then we went from the simplicial version to general cones. I'm also reminding you why Stanley reciprocity worked. We had a cone, we took the fundamental parallel pipette, and what made everything tick was the sort of geometric relation of what happens when we um, flip this fundamental parallel pipette at the origin. And so virtually there is nothing that we have to change for solid angles. To adjust the proof that we gave in chapter 4, to give a proof of this theorem 13.5. So it's the exact same form. And in fact, the situation is somewhat easier. In the case of the integer point transforms, we had to do a little bit of a trick to add up the simplicial cones of a triangulation to get Stanley reciprocity for general cones. For solid angles, we just said our functions are totally additive. The same thing holds for this generating function alpha sub p. And so once you prove theorem 13.5 for the simplicial case, and again, the proof is just like what we did in chapter four, we can now add up those rational functions for a non-simplicial cone from a triangulation. And contrary to chapter four, there's nothing to worry about now because I don't have to use inclusion exclusion. The angles simply add up. This is now the setup of our solid angle quasi-polynomial and the associated integer point transform. And we'll use this basis to now prove some theorems that parallel the theorems from chapter 3 and 4 on Erhard quasi-polynomials and Erhard series. But we'll also see that there are some theorems that only work in the solid angle situation.